Welcome to Smash Fiction, a podcast where we pit fictional characters against one another in a battle of strength, or wits, or being a slightly less shitty wizard, <laughs> <laughs> and see who would win. This week, Orko versus Rincewind. An enchanting orchestral melody seems to play in time to the careful, purposeful movements of old hands as they guide magic into the air. In the light created by the spells stands a wizened man with a gray beard that flows down to his chest, wearing robes of deep blue and a tall pointed hat covered in stars and moons. The music swells as the magic this man creates forms into a large, fantastical creature comprised of every color imaginable. It slowly begins to beat its wings at the somatic commands of the sorcerer, casting prismatic light on every surface. Every color seems to correspond with a perfectly played instrument, every sound composed to match the shifting colors. This beauty and spellcraft is violently interrupted by an unpleasant cacophony of what could only be the falling of iron cauldrons, the shattering of ancient and priceless pottery, and the screaming of a very agitated cat coming from a nearby room. Yeah. <laughs> Sorcerer Yen Sid lets out an exasperated sigh for what must be the ninth time today, as his spell dissolves into smoke, lost along with his concentration. Apprentices, they said. Free labor with the potential for a future highly skilled workforce, they said. Mm -hmm. So much better than animated brooms, they said. <laughs> <laughs> well, this sorcerer was starting to have his doubts. When he had put out the ad for an apprentice, he hadn't expected two very different, yet similarly incompetent wizards to appear on his doorstep at the same time. One was some kind of small, extra-dimensional being with the ability to levitate and clothed so heavily under a red robe, pointed hat, and scarf that not much of him could be seen beyond his blue pointed ears and yellow saucer-like eyes. Yen Sid only gathered that the little man's name was Orko, and that he had come from a place called Eternia, before Sid decided that that was about as much of that dude's voice as he could possibly stand in one sitting. <laughs> <laughs> the second man at the sorcerer's doorstep was perhaps the most pathetic-looking creature Sid had ever seen. He was a tall, lanky fellow with brown hair and a sad, pointed beard that only served to pull his face down further. He wore tattered red robes and a pointed hat embroidered with the word wizard, with two Zs, and introduced himself as Rincewind. The two men had begged the sorcerer to take them as apprentices, though as Sid only needed one, he had found himself in a bit of a predicament. Eh, what the heck. Double the free labor, the old man thought, and hired them both with the understanding that it would be a 90-day probationary period, and that at the end of that period, one would be let go. They would have to run various errands like picking up the right potion ingredients, organizing tomes and scrolls, many in languages they've never seen, fight the occasional dire rat or accidentally animated broomstick army, and study magic in their downtime, all without bothering Sid. Which chucklefuck wizard will the sorcerer hire? Which will he fire? I don't know. I didn't dive into either of these series as a youth. That's why I, Kit Ravenpuff Mulcairin, no. <laughs> will be the judge for this match. Advocating for Orko are Claire Mulcairin. If the things I say in my opening argument sound sort of familiar this time, that's because at this point, 101 episodes in, we can now create entire episodes of Smash Fiction made of nothing but recycled animation. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's so good. And Dan Mulcairin. Magic wand made of glass. Help me to kick Rincewind's... Oh, wait, he just ran away. Never mind. <laughs> nice. Advocating for Rincewind are Meg and Bob. The pen is mightier than the sword. If the sword is very short and the pen is very sharp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pratchett, you're so good. <laughs> and Miles Schneiderman. After we win this match, I'm going to go to the bedroom and my wife and I are going to eat potatoes all night long. Yeah. <laughs> In order to determine which team goes first, I made each team prove to me that magic exists. Dan and Claire are new to magic and figured they should start out with the classic light as a feather, stiff as a board spell. <laughs> After about three hours of chanting, Dan finally got his magical shit together and made Claire float off the ground. But then she just kept floating, and now she needs specially weighted shoes to walk on the ground. So, pretty neat. <laughs> Not buying, though. <laughs> Bob and Miles tried a different approach. They sat me down and showed me a two-minute video from planet Earth of mandarin ducklings leaving the nest, God. set to an especially moving score. Damn right. <laughs> Needless to say, by the end of those two minutes, I was sobbing and have been fully convinced that magic still exists in the world. <laughs> 
I'm crying right now. Uh, this is actually true. <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> the very thought of these ducks. I'll put these it. I'll mandarin put it on ducklings the, is I'll, what they're called. I'll put it on the social media. Put it up on the <laughs> <Okay>. website. <laughs> Just that one planet, yeah. just a random planet Earth video. Yeah. Why this. not? Why else do we have a website if not for that? <laughs> just link to the entire series. So, Team Rincewind, you will be going first. Use your sad sack powers to convince me. Rincewind is a real, no shit, honest to God wizard. He's also a three dimensional character capable of learning and growing. Orko is less of a character and more of a plot device. Let me share with you a summary of a He-Man episode. <laughs> Things are going well in Eternia. Orko tries to use magic to do something relatively simple. Oh no! Something has gone wrong? <laughs> He-Man bashes the problem. Man at arms looks at Orko like he would kill Orko and hide the body if the tar swamps were big enough. End of episode. <laughs> Time and time again, Orko doesn't pay attention, or he makes a magical mistake that causes trouble for everyone around him. Even when he successfully does magic, like in Creatures from the Tar Swamp, the medallion that granted him the power is immediately lost. By him, because he's being a cocky bag of shit. Maybe don't casually swing around your magical item while flying backwards with your eyes closed. Surprisingly, that was not the moral at the end of that episode of He-Man. <laughs> Compare this to the luggage, Rincewind's most powerful magical item. The luggage wouldn't leave Rincewind even if Rincewind begged it to. Hell, it settled down and had a family and abandoned them to return to Ankh-Morpork with Rincewind. The luggage is ride or die and will help Rincewind and his master deal with any magical scariness that comes up. Orko's whole thing is causing problems that give He-Man and the Master of the Universe something to fix. In the episode Daymar the Demon, Orko makes friends with the demon that he summoned and then needed help to deal with that ugly situation. In Disappearing Act, he sends the Power Sword back in time when just trying to clean his room using magic. At the end of the episode, everyone makes him promise not to use magic to clean his room again. We've had <laughs> chuckle fucks on this show before, but Orko is like chuckle fuck prime. He is the original <laughs> and fuckiest of chucklers. <laughs> He can't even run away successfully. If you think that we're pulling too much from early episodes, in episode 65, he runs away from a giant straight to a tree trunk, which knocks him out. You'd think he'd get better at running away considering how much he does it. Rincewind, on the other hand, is a pro at running away and survives everything. He survives going to actual hell in Eric. He helps kill a horrifying <laughs> tentacle beast in the light fantastic, as well as crack the eggs of tiny world turtles using magic. He gets Coin the Sorcerer to put down his magical staff, which is essentially possessing him by his dad, kind of. This is a thing that Death <laughs> themselves thought would never happen. The putting down part, not the dad possession part. This act saves the disc world. In fact, that's what Rincewood does a lot, saving the entire goddamn world. That is the plot of the Light Fantastic, the plot of sorcery, and mostly the plot of The Last Continent. Sure, he ends up in disastrous and awful situations, but rises to the occasion time after time. When it comes to being an apprentice, Orko is doomed. He doesn't work with other magic users except his uncle. When he runs up against magic users that aren't on his side, even Evil Inn can kick his floaty little butt. Sure, he allegedly learned some magic from his uncle, but I seriously suspect that his uncle pushed him to that cosmic storm or whatever just to get rid of him. Rincewind <laughs> is used to being around all kinds of wizards and sorcerers, from the crazy powerful and demented like Emperor Trimon, to the kind that just think getting up to see the sunrise is invigorating, like Rid Cully. And let's not forget that he's worked as a library assistant with the librarian, a sizable ape. He's able to deal with wizards without attracting their displeasure. That's no small thing. And orangutans are 200 pounds of muscle. If Rincewind <laughs> wasn't able to get his job done and succeed as an assistant, the librarian would have frightened him off or just popped his head like a grape. Even when the wizards he works with get in over their heads, Rincewind is able to help. In the last continent, the wizards are trapped 30,000 years in the past, as evidenced by cave drawings. Rincewind is able to rescue them by figuring out that drawing their image on the same cave drawing will merge time. It works, and the unseen university faculty are brought back into the present. If this had been an episode of He-Man, only Sorceress of Castle Grayskull Ex Machina would have saved the Masters <laughs> of the Universe, because Orko damn sure wouldn't have been able to fix the problem. Rincewind may be unlucky, but he's got a track record with magic and intuition that have made him so bizarrely powerful that not even Death knows when his number will be up. 
Yeah, let's be clear about one thing. This match isn't about either of these characters excelling at any specific set of skills. Quite the opposite, in fact. This match is about being chosen. Rincewind and Orko can run around and try to do stuff, sure, but in the end, a third character will be on hand to decide their fate. And if there's one person here who has a history of being chosen, it's Rincewind. Not only is he the worldly avatar of the Lady, who is essentially a goddess of luck, not only is Death himself completely in the dark in regard to how and when Rincewind will die, but he was personally <laughs> selected by the creator to carry one of the eight great spells inside his mind until it was time for him to use that magic to save the world. I mean, I'm assuming the creator chose him, which is why Rincewind, as a student at Unseen University, was somehow able to bypass the safeguards on the creator's personal spellbook, open it, and read it. The only other explanation is that Rincewind is an obscenely powerful wizard, so I guess take your pick? The reason that Yen Sid is going to make the same decision as Lady Luck, the Grim Reaper, and God is that, where Orko is an extremely high-variance magician, Rincewind is consistent. For one thing, due to being the lady's chosen one, dude is literally a lightning rod for bad luck. Why the hell do you think Unseen University keeps him around? As long as Rincewind is in the immediate vicinity, bad things are not going to happen to you because they will be too busy happening to him. <laughs> Furthermore, if there is ever a super important or dangerous mission or quest requiring somebody to go on it and Rincewind is around, he will be selected to go on that important or dangerous mission or quest. You can just write it down. No matter how hard anyone tries or doesn't try to prevent it, Rincewind will be on that boat or on that hot air balloon or on that spaceship. <laughs> if Rincewind is your apprentice, not only will bad luck cling to him like Beastman's hair to everything in Skeletor's wardrobe, Yay. <laughs> but you will instantly be on the forefront of every major magical discovery or political upheaval. You will have an apprentice who is, on a cosmic level, one of the most important people in the universe, and whom the universe will treat as an important person. But at the same time, Rincewind will never know that he's important. He won't get a big head and try to abandon you at the first hint of success. His prospects will never improve so much that he won't need you to remain his master. Employers kill for this kind of stability. Where does Rincewind see himself in five years? Right here, sir. Absorbing all the bad luck and making sure you make the local headlines. When do I start? Now, it is possible that Yen Sid won't know all this about Rincewind in the beginning, although it's really his own fault if he doesn't use ZipRecruiter. <laughs> so, how will Rincewind demonstrate the consistency that makes him a genuine asset to not only those around him, but to the world as a whole? The answer is, anything and everything Yen Sid needs him to do. The nature of the errand doesn't change how it's gonna go. Rincewind will flail and scream and get knocked down and beaten up and very nearly killed acquiring that new shipment of six-eyed slug vomit, but acquire it, he fucking well shall. <laughs> Going through absolute hell to get the job done is what he do. He is described as having the body of a long-distance sprinter and has a great deal of running experience, making him physically fit enough for any task. He is incredibly intelligent. He's one of the greatest linguists on the Discworld and would canonically be a nuclear physicist if he lived in our world. And he has unbelievable levels of natural tenacity that have seen him through almost every conceivable type of danger, up to and including Terry Pratchett's version of Cthulhu. The only thing that prevented him from learning magic in the first place was the creator's spell taking up all the space in his mind and scaring all the other spells away. <laughs> Pratchett's words. <laughs> and now that shit is gone. Only his terrible, goddess-inspired bad luck prevents him from being a Gary Stu, and that shit works both ways. Because no matter how much he fucks things up along the way, Rincewind always succeeds in the end. That's his pattern. Begin quest for slug vomit, fuck quest up immediately, say hello to Death, who's over here wondering if this is finally it, power through <laughs> on will alone, deliver slug vomit. That's consistency. That's the kind of thing that gets you chosen. This episode of Smash Fiction, not brought to you by ZipRecruiter, <laughs> but it can be. Yeah. Get at us, Zip. Yeah. Team Orko. So, do you even have legs? Like, what's going on under there? <laughs> <laughs> Come over here and take a look. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, legs aren't the thing I would be asking about, kid, personally. <laughs> if you were a teacher, who would you rather take on as your pupil? An aloof student with no skill and no interest in the subject matter you were teaching, or a student with undeniable natural talent and enthusiasm, but little formal training? 
what we have here is a match between two wizards who really aren't good at being wizards, but these two characters fail at being wizards for pretty much completely opposite reasons. Rincewind fails at being a wizard because he isn't willing to try anything difficult and he has no magical abilities at all. Orko fails at being a wizard because he tries too hard to do spells that are outside his comfort zone and his natural magical abilities are often too powerful to control. The most commonly cited reason why Orko's magic is difficult to control is because the series takes place on Eternia, which is not Orko's home dimension. He's originally from a world called Trolla, which is sort of like Eternia, but more colorful and weird. <laughs> like, picture Eternia. You know how Eternia is all grim and serious and grounded in reality? Yeah, that's how weird of a place Trolla is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the laws of physics on Trolla are very different from the laws of physics on Eternia, and so despite the fact that Orko is regarded as a famous sorcerer in his home dimension, his spells sometimes malfunction when he's on Eternia. In the episode, Dawn of Dragoon, we get to see Orko casting spells in his home dimension, and they all work perfectly. He stops a fire-breathing monster by blasting it with a jet of water, he later buries that monster by summoning an avalanche, and at the end of the episode he even reverses a sleeping curse that has enchanted one of his friends. But even when he's on Eternia, the problem is never that his magic is too weak. Often the problem is that his magic works too well. Like in The Rarest Gift of All, when Tila was baking a cake and Orko tried to help her by making the cake rise faster, the cake ended up growing out of control and also literally rising up and floating into the air. Or in Trouble in Trolla, Orko Orko tries to do a magic trick for an audience with Prince Adam as his assistant. He puts Adam into a box and then tries to use magic to make Prince Adam disappear, but instead he makes the entire audience disappear and then reappear crammed inside the box with Prince Adam. That's some impressive magical power he's working with. Much like how Professor X felt when he first saw Jean Grey, or how Qui-Gon Jinn felt when he first saw Anakin Skywalker, <laughs> once Yen Sid sees what Orko is capable of, he isn't just going to want to train this young prodigy, he's going to feel like he needs to do it. This much raw magical talent needs to be shaped by a master's hand. That being said, sometimes Orko's magic is seen as being quite reliable, and my current theory is that this most often happens when he doesn't overthink it. He regularly uses magic to telekinetically retrieve objects, or to conjure everyday items into existence when he needs something. There are also plenty of examples I could give of times when he's used his powers in combat against Skeletor's minions, and they've done exactly what he wants them to do. Usually the malfunctions come when he tries to do something big and flashy to try to impress someone. Orko's magic seems to be tied to his confidence. When he's not worried about it, it works fine. When he gets nervous, things go awry. Orko also shows at many points throughout the series that he is surprised smart. My favorite episode to highlight for this is Orko's Return, where Beastman and Trapjaw get a magic amulet that forces Orko to follow their commands, and they try to use his magic for their own ends. But whenever they give him an order, Orko comes up with a way to cast a spell which technically follows their commands, while also pulling the old monkey's paw and twisting their wishes against him. This shows that not only does Orko frequently have enough control over his magic to make it do exactly what he wants, but he's also smart enough to be able to do so with one metaphorical magical hand tied behind his back. Eventually, he screws over Beastman and Trapjaw so many times that they just let him go and beg him to please stop following following their commands. One last point that gives Orko an undeniable edge in this match is that he's simply going to be more fun to be around. Rincewind can be a fucking bummer. <laughs> <laughs> Orko, on the other hand, is not only Eternia's court magician, he's also the court jester. Many episodes of He-Man open with Orko performing magic and or comedy for a captive audience, who always end up laughing at his antics. In one episode, Orko is considering running away from home, and the sorceress shows him a vision of what the future would be like a year from now if he never returned. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that everyone, including the two stickiest sticks in the mud ever, King Randor and Man-at-Arms, talk about how much they miss having him around. King Randor says, The problems of ruling a kingdom seemed less with Orko here to make me laugh. <laughs> Later, Tila says, I really miss him. We had such fun together. And Queen Marlena says, Someone as helpful and generous as Orko will make friends wherever he goes. You can teach a student theory. You can teach a student techniques. The only thing you can't teach a student is enthusiasm. And in the end, that's really Orko's biggest edge in this match. Even setting aside the fact that he comes from a species that has so much raw magic flowing through their veins that they eschew walking in favor of levitation. Orko as an individual loves doing magic, and more than anything, he wants to be good at it. And you know what? He's already a lot closer to being a good wizard than he thinks he is. All he needs is a good teacher. In the vast, vast majority of things, Rincewind is the pinnacle of incompetence. I would feel pretty good about my chances of going up against Rincewind, regardless of what character I was advocating for and what the actual challenge was. But when my character is a wizard and the challenge is doing magic, that's when my chances go from pretty reliable to downright unfair. Rincewind is described as being, quote, the magical equivalent of the number zero. The suggestion has been made that, when Rincewind dies, the average occult ability of the human race will actually go up. During his time at Unseen University, he never passed a single exam. In fact, the highest score he ever received there was 2% for spelling his name correctly. 
He was so bad that when he took basic fire starting, he received a negative grade, an occurrence which the faculty of the university still doesn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Rincewind may or may not have been born inherently incapable of performing magic skillfully, but either way, before the events of the Color of Magic, he happened to glance into the Octavo, perhaps the most powerful spellbook in Discworld, and one of the eight great spells of the creator jumped into his brain, scaring off any other spells Rincewind might have been trying to learn. The great spell has since left his brain, and he hasn't been able to learn any magic since. As if to further underscore how much of a non-wizard this guy is, the spell of creation that Rincewind has in his head throughout the first two Discworld books is presented as potentially cataclysmic, and will sometimes begin to force Rincewind to cast it. It turns out that all this tension is largely unwarranted, because when Rincewind actually tries to cast this spell at the end of the Light Fantastic, he botches it. Mind you, he is reading it directly out of a spell book, and he botches it. <laughs> Yen Sid at this point would be better off picking Jar Jar Binks as his apprentice <laughs> than Rincewind. <laughs> at least Jar Jar was never definitively proven to be superhumanly incompetent at magic. In the book Sorcery, events lead to the area around Rincewind becoming temporarily saturated with magical energy, which gives Rincewind the temporary ability to actually use magic. He ends up doing so extremely clumsily, accidentally summoning donuts and turning stone into lemon custard. This means that it takes a world-altering, near-cataclysmic event for Rincewind to start to approach being as good of a wizard as Orko is. But Rincewind's unsuitability as a sorcerer's apprentice doesn't just stop at his inability to put a spell together, because Rincewind is a tremendous, overwhelming coward. He often has to be threatened by death in order to get anything done. This is actually the only way he gets involved in the plot of The Color of Magic, and the second Rincewind begins to suspect that things might get dangerous, or unpredictable, or just plain interesting, he runs. This is his one and only defense mechanism, and he is always very willing to use it. In Sorcery, it's revealed that he loves lettuce because of how boring it is. Yeah. He actively seeks tedium. How enthusiastically do you think he'll throw himself into pursuing magic? Look, neither of these characters are known for their competence. Where they differ is that Orko is courageous, enthusiastic, and always looking for a way to solve his problem. Rincewind is a complete and utter coward, always looking for a way out of a tough situation. From minute one, Rincewind is always looking for a way to not deal with his problem. An incompetent character who nevertheless doesn't give up and keeps trying will inevitably be more successful than an incompetent character who readily gives up and retreats. These two should trade the writing on their respective clothing, because Orko is the real wizard here, mm -hmm. while Rincewind is just a zero. So, Claire, are you trying to tell me there is a He-Man episode with Orko that is basically It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> it's, yep, it is. <laughs> What's it called again? I, I think so, Which one's that? I think say about that, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, it's the rarest gift of all. Oh, oh fantastic. They, anyway. yeah. Every series Spoiler needs one. Spoiler for what the rarest gift of all is. It's friendship. <laughs> Wait, I feel, no, they cheated. They used that in another episode, too. Time for rebooties. Team Rincewind. Time to drag that floating smurf. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's cute. So one of the things that you mentioned is that Orko is not confident, and that's the reason why his magic doesn't succeed. Really? I feel like he's too confident, like way too confident, because he's like, no, I'm going to do this thing using magic, and it'll be fine. It's going to be just fine. And then he does the thing, and then it all goes horribly wrong, and then Sorcerer shows up and goes, aww. And then the moral at the end well, is, if you get in over your head, it's okay to ask for help. That was literally the moral from that one episode. So what that points to is the idea that Orko is very worried all the time that he's not as useful as the other people on the team. He was worried because he looks up to everyone else on the team. They're so cool and competent. He's just like, I don't know what his age is. He's implied to be a little bit more of a kid. He says at one point in time that man at arm sends him to his room. So I assume <laughs> that he's like a kid or something. Yeah. But anyway, he's of indeterminate age. <laughs> yeah. um, he tries to like bite off more than he can chew. You know, he's eager. He tries to do these big spells. He puts forth this confidence because he wants to seem confident, but it's all just a front, of course. The thing that's going to be different in this case is he's actually going to have a magical teacher who knows more about magic than he does that can help fix his mistakes. The reason he's not improving over the course of the series is because there aren't any other like magicians that like try to teach him magic. He's just in the castle all the time and it's just man at arm saying, Orko, don't do that again. But like that's not helpful. Both of you guys mentioned that uh, Rincewind doesn't want to be a wizard, like actually doesn't seem to really have a whole lot of drive to pursue the magical arts. Let me tell you what happens when Rincewind doesn't want something. 
<laughs> it occurs. <laughs> that is fucking divine happenstance. That's probably the reason why every time he's had the opportunity to walk away from the wizarding path that he kind of walks on, he hasn't been able to take it. Miles, like, you're leaning a lot on the sort of resilience of Rincewind's personal storyline that, like, he always messes things up but then always succeeds in the end, and in your case, he always gets what he doesn't want, so if he doesn't want to be a great wizard, then he's gonna be a great wizard, but, like, there are a few moments in Discworld where Rincewind, like, temporarily gets magical power through some really exceptional means, but the thing is, he always loses them, and he's always totally against using it at all. Like, there was, <laughs> there was one point in the book, Eric where he gets magical powers for a second and accidentally uses them. And the quote is, Rincewind gave his fingers a long, shocked stare, <laughs> as one might regard a gun that has been hanging on the wall for decades and has suddenly gone off and perforated the cat. I love that like, line so much! Of course he has! <laughs> if you're relying on his personal storyline sort of turning up the way it always does, it's not going to end up with him becoming a competent I, wizard. I, I'm not relying on his personal storyline. I'm relying on the gods that are interested in what happens to him and alter events so that they go a certain way. But also, you seem to be under the impression that the goal of this match is to be the best magic user, which is categorically not the case. The primary goal of this match is to get a bunch of menial shit done, and every time Orko tries to get menial shit done, like, for example, clean his room. Don't know how much pressure he was under, but he's gonna try to get I, it done with magic and he's going to utterly fail. I mean, Man at Arms is really mean, guys. He's so mean. <laughs> but see, here's the thing, Miles. Like, look at the apprentice that Yen Sid chose in the past. It was Mickey Mouse, and the one thing we see Mickey Mouse do is, like, try to do a magic thing, and end up screwing it up. Yeah, and so now Yen the dude Sid, has learned more! He's learned better! Right, but Yen Sid was angry by the end of that little short, but, like, he gave Mickey Mouse a look that said, okay, now you've learned your lesson, and we will still continue on. If it's between yeah, Orko- Yeah, he gives him the buckets and, like, basically says, get back to work. Like, he doesn't it, fire him, he's just like, If it's between yeah. Orko, who basically does that all the time, and Rincewind, who has to be threatened with death to get his ass out the door in the morning, I know which one Yen Sid is gonna go with. You were talking about, uh, how his- his magic is too powerful? Especially whenever he's on Eternia, because it's pretty unpredictable. You're suggesting that he's capable of sort of learning and growing, which that's not been the case in the 65 episodes that he's learned to kind of maybe pull back or try something different. He does the same thing because it's He-Man, and the same thing ends up happening is that it goes horribly wrong. And I know that you're saying, well, he doesn't have a teacher, but then you're also then saying that he can't identify cause and effect. I mean, that's fair. Yeah, like, we're talking genre conventions here, or a little bit of what's going on, you know, like, you're dealing with all of the weird destiny and gods stuff that's going on all the time in Discworld, where, like, there's all the stuff about, like, you know, if something has a one in a million chance of happening, it has a 100% chance of happening. <laughs> you have all of your weird genre conventions in Discworld. We have all of our genre conventions, which is that everything has to return back to normal yeah, our, at the end of every episode. It's not so our none fault of the characters that ours works in our favor. <laughs> <laughs> but the question here is, over the course of a couple months of working with them, which character is Yen Sid going to see more potential in? He's not going to necessarily see all the weird Destiny stuff going on with Rincewind, and he's not going to necessarily see that it's taken 65 episodes and Orko still hasn't gotten his shit together because he's still a dumb little <laughs> kid. So it's just about who he's going to see more potential in. And I think based on, like, a snapshot of them, there's more potential that he's going to well, see in Orko than he's going to see in Rincewind. I think he's going to kick Orko's ass out because Orko is fucking annoying as shit and just completely awful. <laughs> this argument about, like, how Orko <laughs> is charming. Look, it is not anybody's fault but their own that Eternians suck, as I've gone into before, <laughs> and they don't know what fucking humor is. And, like, the moment they lose the worst puns <laughs> and the worst form of entertainment in the world, they go into some kind of ennui because that's literally the best comedy and the most charm they've ever been exposed to. Now that I've gotten the salt that I required from this level <laughs> of rebuttals, I'm ready to move on to the next right. one. Team Orko! You gonna let some shaggy look-alike talk shit? 
He has a shaggy look. -like. See, there you go. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. You guys are talking a lot about the mistakes that Orko makes, which I am not going to deny. I think that you guys are overstating it, but despite his tendency to make mistakes, he always owns up to them. Like, there's the episode Disappearing Act when he accidentally makes Adam's sword disappear, but then throughout the course of the episode, he risks his life twice in his efforts to make things right. Like, there's even one part where he gives up his clothes and gets naked to help defeat Skeletor in that episode. And I should point out, like, all of his efforts in that episode to make things right are successful. I, <laughs> I just don't even know what to say. I mean, like, so he says sorry when he makes, like, at least when Rincewind makes mistakes, it's because, like, as you said, he's got not no magical ability, but zero magical ability. There is a difference. Zero magical ability applies that he has the potential to have some later. But at least when Rincewind makes mistakes, he knows why, and it's not because he's being a cocky little shit. And he hasn't ever asked anyone to please not tell Man at Arms about it. If I was a teacher, <laughs> I would. If I was a teacher, I'd rather have my student be doing it because they're young and they want to impress me, not because. They are a full adult who should know better right now and have adopted slacking as a way of life that they are determined to cling to for all eternity. Okay, <laughs> you were talking about that a lot, and I just want to really dispute this whole, like, Rincewind is a quitter and, like, slacks off thing. Every book he's in, the dude never fucking gives up. Yeah, if he wanted to give up, he'd just lay down and die, but he yeah, has not. seriously. What's that quote about running away as a philosophy? I know, yeah, and do yet, you guys have a different, yet, like, do you not believe that running away is giving up? Because I'm pretty sure that's, like, no, the very physical manifestation of giving up. That's to run away another day. Yeah, that's I That's another day of life. If you're facing a Cthulhu monster and you don't run away, then you're not going to get the task done because you're going to be dead. Yeah, the so thing is, though, Ritzwin doesn't just run away from Cthulhu's. He runs away from everything. Anytime something begins to look like it might get interesting, he is miles away. And you know what? He's alive and a lot of the other Discworld characters are not. Yeah, and, <laughs> I, and I also really just want to point out that, like, as the books progress... His philosophy does sort of evolve into this, um, not quite nihilistic, but, like, a fatalistic interpretation of reality. Yeah, so, so like, good! So, like, in later books, instead of, like, being the character that you're describing, which is almost exclusively from earlier books, Rincewind is a reluctant hero who accepts that fate will not let him get out of heroing. And he does live up to that. You seem to relying a lot on the whole, like, whatever, destiny and gods and stuff, just because I think there's been a lot of trash talked about Orko's inability to use magic reliably. I'm just going to list off a couple more examples of times when he has solved problems using magic and it's worked. In the episode Driel's Return, there's a MacGuffin, which is this magic horn. He telekinetically pulls it out of the bad guy's hands and saves the day. He's being chased by a bunch of enemies in the Bitter Rose, and he teleports away from them. He's trapped in some ropes in an episode Trouble and Trolla, and an arm grows out of his head that's holding a pair of scissors and cuts the ropes and frees everyone. Oh like, god, that was he so He solves freaky. a lot of problems using magic. My counter to that would be, not to go back to this well too many times, but in the Creatures from the Tower Swamps episodes, Skeletor captures him by holding onto his shoulder shoulders and holding Orko at arm's length. I believe it was the two of you who made the argument that Skeletor is ridiculously lame and only has one hit point. And he is... <laughs> he does have one hit point, but he has very strong grip. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he is on... He's, he's got those bony hands. They're like really... They can hold on real he tight. He's oh easily able to defeat Orko on multiple occasions. Well, in fairness, I don't think Rinson would stand much of yeah, a chance I against Skeletor. I disagree. Either. I absolutely disagree. Rinson would find a way to get the job done if it meant running away from him until he was back behind Skeletor again. There's one point I want to make, uh, which is about a point that you brought up, Miles, about how in one alternate reality, Rincewind is uh, a nuclear physicist. I just want to point out that in that reality, yes. he specialized in accidentally setting nuclear reactors on fire. Yeah. So <laughs> Dude, not, not he doesn't really speak that well to his confidence. Not accidentally. His area of specialty was in figuring out what happens when nuclear reactors catch on fire. I feel as though he may have fallen into that career. If you also, know I mean. at one point, he's listed as being an unseen university professor who specializes in how flowers make people feel. So he's also like professor of cruel and unusual geography. He has a lot. Yeah. Of, he wears a lot of hats. 
Yeah, how many fucking titles do you have, Orko? Well, in fairness, how, how all, of, all of Sorcerer Rinswin's, and Trolla? <laughs> yeah, all of Rinswin's titles were given to him either A, out of pity, or B, out of, like, trying to make him stay away from the important I, stuff I, so that he didn't mess it up. I mean... Like, and all it's gotten him is, like, 19 buckets of coal a year. Again. That's all he has to show for. They purposefully, gave him, is cool they purposefully him. gave him all of the titles that didn't allow him to collect a salary. Yeah, he's he's I mean, the that's only that's person academia. who knows the librarian's that's real academia. name. So, what I learned... Is that Skeletor min maxed his HP and his arms? <laughs> <laughs> what system is he using? <laughs> is that some a like special? He, it's a homebrew that he made for me. Like, <laughs> oh my god! It's just like the oh. weirdest Savage Worlds variant there is. <laughs> yeah, he used his physical beauty as a dump stat. That's why he got the <laughs> face. But he got super Are small. You oh, how no, dare you? That, that man is, is beautiful. Great burn. No, please use that as a burn in the future. How dare like, you? He's beautiful. You look like you used your charisma as a dump stat. <laughs> oh, dang. In a magical mishap that could only be caused by not one but two shitty wizards trying to earn the favor of their boss, the absolute worst combination of potions are mixed into a cauldron that then begins to spew forth dark clouds that collect ominously against the ceiling. Soon, they begin to thunder and transform the room into the lightning round. No! Hey! Oh, run away! I, did not, I weirdly <laughs> did not see that coming for some reason. Magical lightning bolts in every color barrage the room, changing the appearance of everything it strikes until it has been fully transformed into a workshop filled with various fabrics, wigs, makeup, all manner of miscellaneous objects, and two large work tables. Orko and Rincewind clutch each other tightly in fear as they scan the room for something that makes sense. You called? An incredibly sharply dressed man says as he steps out of the cauldron and brushes some dust off his suit. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Garrett King. Orko and Rincewind simply stare at the man the most highly esteemed fashion critic in all the wizarding worlds. <laughs> Orko and Rincewind stare silently. <sighs> Never mind. I'll just explain. You're in a fashion reality show now. Each of you will be assigned a theme on which you will base your outfit. You may use anything in this room, and you will then have to model your creation for me, and... Oh, hold on. Garrett snaps his fingers, and right beside him, instantaneously, appears David Bowie. <gasps> For me and my guest judge, Lord of High Fashion and about seven other things I can't be bothered to list off right now, David Bowie. <laughs> is David Bowie a patron? <laughs> God, I wish. I mean, if he is, and he's only giving $10, I'm gonna be really mad, because, like, that oh, man can afford so much more. No, David Bowie gets it for free. <laughs> So there you have it. A sorcerer far more powerful and better dressed than the two of you has commanded you to make clothing based on a theme. Team Orko, your theme is Granny Weatherwax. Oh, nice. <laughs> Team Rincewind, your theme is Skeletor. Oh, yeah! <laughs> now, you cannot just make a costume of those characters and call that an outfit. Oh, of course That's not. That's cosplay, of not course. fashion. Oh, no. Think Disney bounding. Think outside the box. Design clothing based off the character you were assigned, and you may pull inspiration from the medium the character theme came from as well, in the style of casual wear, office-appropriate clothing, swimwear, and finally, lingerie. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Aw, oh, Kit, I love you. <laughs> Don't be afraid to accessorize. After you've made your outfits, tell me that one special thing you do to try and wow the judges on the runway. As is smash fic tradition, we'll be reversing the team order. Team Orko? Slay. So first down the runway is, of course, our casual line. You will notice that we've gone with a lot of black, as Granny Weatherwax is very fond of wearing. But fortunately, black is always fashionable. Black is always in. Don't believe what they say about something being the new black. You know what's the new black? Black. Black is the new black. <laughs> Now, Orko, you'll notice, has brought a little bit of his own fashion sense into this particular outfit. Orko, of course, always wears a scarf. Scarfs are very in, and we've incorporated scarfs very, uh, very intentionally into this design. I think it adds a nice silhouette to the, uh, to the overall picture. The judges are nodding, yes, yes. You will notice that, like Granny Weatherwax, there are a lot of hat pins sticking directly out of the hat <laughs> that the model is wearing. Uh, these are purely decorative and serve no actual purpose, but they do serve to send the message that... I may not be an old woman, but I sure as hell emulate the way that an old woman dresses. <laughs> uh, 
And of course, the must-have accessory with this particular outfit is the handbag which our model is carrying. You will notice the loops hanging off of the bottom, which are ideal for carrying your broom in. And uh, written on the side of every handbag is, of course, the phrase, I at dead, which is oh. ideal for any witch engaging in astral projection. Next up, we have Orko modeling his office-appropriate gear, which in this case, in tribute to the Great Turtle, um, Great <laughs> A2N. He actually has a suit that has a pattern on it that's supposed to look like the patterning on a sea turtle. Mm -hmm. And the top of his little tie, it's like a bola tie with a little two things that head out, but the little like buckle thingy on the tie uh, is a little turtle head. Mm -hmm. And also on his back, there's four uh, little ceramic elephants and then a giant platter. And all over the platter are a whole bunch of different office supplies. <laughs> like uh, there's post-it notes and uh, a stapler <laughs> and a fax machine and like a bunch of stuff so that like whenever he goes to the office not only does he look fashionable but it's also very practical a fax machine <laughs> yeah well, what you need when you're in an office you need, you need to send faxes do you, do you take it everywhere oh my god that's you're gonna get back problems but you no, will be the, the topic he's is got magic cooler. don't worry about it um, and also his hat has been repurposed into a uh, trash can and paper shredder because as you know he has a pocket dimension inside of his hat he can like pull things out of it and it also works in reverse people can like dispose of documents into the void that is his hat <laughs> And coming down the runway now is our model with the new swimwear line from Orco. Granny Weatherwax, is, as many know, is uh, an older, somewhat more prudish woman. And so we have modeled the swimwear overall design on the sort of full body 20s era <laughs> swimwear uh, yeah. that was popular about 100 years ago. Uh, <laughs> however, you will notice that we have designed the swim cap to look like gray hair. <laughs> uh, and because Esmeralda Weatherwax, one of her specialties is projecting her mind into the body of animals, we've added a number of animal touches onto the swimwear, uh, including there are uh, long trailing pieces of fabric that when in the water resemble eel tails. The flippers that you can get with it are designed to exactly emulate those of frogs. There are goggles which are uh, designed to be exactly like fish eyes, so <laughs> you too can emulate the full experience of going swimming as Esmeralda Weatherwax. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. And, and last but not least, we have the lingerie. This consists of two pieces. The first one, because, you know, Orko's still a little bit shy. The troll ends have a big thing where it's very intimate to not show their faces. They don't show unless unless it's somebody they really care about. So he has a little veil that looks similar to the one that Driel wears. <laughs> and then the only other thing that he has is there's a single piece that is designed to look like a broom that wraps around his body. <laughs> so it just, like, it goes over the nipples and then it, like, wraps around his back and, like, goes between his, his legs. Um, and, and then it has, like, a weird little like tail that comes out the back that's like a little broom tail <laughs> uh, which is a, a tribute to granny weatherwax's uh here broom writing days and i have i have one more joke here and if if kit will allow it we'll see i could you know, be careful um uh, he he's gonna be holding up a sign just in case anyone was concerned that says i ain't an underage oh, <laughs> oh, damn. Oh. i mean but what if he is wait that was no. a liar he's not though Trust the sign. Oh, no! <laughs> He's ageless. Oh, we have to burn the podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we do. Um, okay. Team Rincewind, how many false proclamations of your wizardry have you embroidered onto these clothes? <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so casual wear. You have to imagine this is high concept casual wear. This is runway casual wear. This is not like mm -hmm. I'm going to Albertson's casual wear. Very wizarding, so it's going to be this loose, dark blue silk shirt that's very, like, billowy. But whenever you walk, because it's silk, it's just going to press up against you so you can see all of your many <laughs> muscles that you have. And give you that real, like, Skeletor feel, because obviously none of us here would ever dare skip arm or leg day. Skeletor shouldn't have skipped face day. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? Okay. <laughs> Um, and then there's going to be this leather lacing that's interwoven into it across the chest in the traditional X, the Eternian X that they have. Uh, and then it's going to wrap around the back. So it's going to be one continuous loop of leather. And it's going to wrap around kind of the middle to suggest a chastity belt that Skeletor's really into for some reason. 
And then it's going to be a skirt. He's kind of into skirts. But it's going to be a uh, sort of purple wool, but it's going to be in leaves. So it gives the look of leather, but a little bit more practical than that. And then it is going to be some of those crazy ass ultra platform shoes that are <laughs> impractical. But whenever you're standing there, goddamn, do you look good. For office wear coming down the aisle, you know, they say you should dress for the job you want, not the job you have. So what we're presenting here, it was inspired by uh, the Vivian Westwood uh, Time Machine Collection. Oh, um, only, God, I love you, only this, Only in this case, we're calling it the Rincewind Time Travel with Hopes of Killing He-Man Collection. <laughs> <laughs> This suit that's being presented here, it's kind of a power business suit, but it's done in a certain style that essentially, and you can look this up, this is actually real, essentially uh, looks like basically plate armor. It looks as though you're armored against all sorts of inter-office battle, which is important when you only have one hit point. Armor is a really important thing. <laughs> in that Roger embracing it finally. I, you know, fuck it. Miles, when has anyone on Eternia ever worn armor? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is not Skeletor coming up with this, all right? Rincewind is making improvements on attorney design and being inspired by their fashion sense. So on that note, while you might think that uh, we would go with the somewhat garish blue or purple suit, that's a little bit too much, especially in an office setting. This suit is actually going to be colored to look like bone, Ooh. Uh, obviously for the, the skull and skeletal's face. So it's kind of ivory-esque uh, in color, but a little bit darker, a little bit less shiny in that regard. The skull motif is in evidence on the suit, but it's very subdued. We're talking about like cufflinks, maybe a little one on the tie. But then again, you know, Skeletor's never really been great at being subdued. So that effect is kind of counterbalanced by the giant fucking ram skulls on the shoulders, <laughs> <laughs> which just like really, they give you a look where you really feel comfortable laughing maniacally. <laughs> That's great. This is a, a suit for taking over the world, you know, dress for the job you want. <laughs> now, the swimwear is a little bit more minimalist. And by a little bit, I mean, it's basically a Speedo <laughs> because, you know, I mean, Skeletor <laughs> needs to show off the rock and bod, man. And like Eternians basically do wear Speedos, except they're a little <laughs> bit furrier than usual. So the pattern on the Speedo actually gives the visual impression of being furry but is not, in fact, furry. It is of a black-blue-purple uh, coloring there. The really cool thing about the Speedo, though, is that it's made of a specific type of fabric that's been magically reinforced and comes actually with a command word so that <laughs> oh, no. when you want it to, much in the same way that Skeletor's face was melted off by acid your Speedo will melt off as well. <laughs> and, you know, just there might be certain circumstances where you want that to happen, and we provide that option. No other fabric can do that for you. Jeez. Oh, my God. Guys, it's, it's not going to get better. <laughs> okay, <laughs> lingerie. I don't know who you're imagining walking down this runway, but just imagine, just choose somebody. All right, you got him? Okay. So, shoulder shield. So it's basically pauldrons, except that it is feathers. And it's going to be dark blue, black feathers that curve sensually over the shoulders to sort of shield them from harm and like, you know, lustful gazes. You want to keep your shoulders secretive. <laughs> However, in the spirit of Skeletor, your tits are hanging out. Those, <laughs> those are free and enjoying the breezes, your shoulders sensually hidden. Instead of underwear, <laughs> you have a ram skull molded out of leather. <laughs> oh, and it's, no, 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 it sits flat against the skin. The snout part of it does. So it just looks like your junk is a ram skull trying to eat people. But then the ram, <laughs> the ram horns like curve to wrap around your thighs. So that way you have this like really sexy monster junk going on. That's really going to make people go, oh, am I going to get lucky or eaten? And then slippers, but these slippers are like sort of spider web, except that they look like metatarsals and stuff. So that way, you know, whenever you're in bed, people can be like, oh, look, there's your little toesies. Except it's your actual toe bones, but not because it's spiders. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's sexier than toe bones? Ugh. Uh, apparently shoulders, because that's the new erogenous zone. <laughs> On yeah, a turning, exactly. I guess. <laughs> 
There are certainly more shoulders covered in Eternia than chests. <laughs> That's for sure. Your shoulders are for your loved ones. <laughs> Well, while I uh, go off and dream about getting my own ram skull pauldrons and underwear, <laughs> uh, y'all y'all discuss amongst yourselves. Well, Bob, oh. you've done it again. You gave me some do? more nightmares. About what? How? You're going to have nightmares from that? About ram skull shaped junk trying to eat Wait, me. Wait, why so. would that give you nightmares instead of like erotic dreams? I don't understand. <laughs> erotic nightmares. There you go. <laughs> Ah, uh, so dreamy. Guys, I have a lot of feelings about He-Man. Yeah, so <laughs> what are your feelings? So this is your first time really delving into these shows, right? Yeah, I had never seen an episode of She-Ra or He-Man growing up, ever. I, as you guys know, I watched the Christmas special first, and I didn't watch anything else. <laughs> Which, <laughs> it's, so, it's good. so good! I was like, I was angry that the other episodes aren't gonna be like the Christmas special, because I loved the Christmas special so much. It felt so powerfully gay to me that I was like oh my god if I had seen this as a kid it would have felt like home it would have been like oh look at this magical world where everybody is definitely not straight there's something else happening but. there's a lot of rainbows there's a lot of people that dress in clothing that if they were dressed that way walking around the real world people would uh make some assumptions yeah about them. could definitely fit into the village people like, but straight more up. than that, this kind of blew my mind because this is one of the reasons why I didn't watch a lot of cartoons, especially like a quote unquote boy cartoons growing up, is because they are not particularly tender or friendship oriented. They're very, they tend to be like smashy, smashy. And He-Man is surprisingly tender and loving and friendship oriented. It's supportive rather than destructive. I was surprised because I watched a lot of like Orco Spotlight episodes in preparation for this one. And I was surprised at how many times... Like, Man-at-Arms or He-Man will say to Orko that they love yeah. him. <laughs> like, it was a lot. They even let He-Man cry, and I feel like they let King Randor cry. It seemed so progressive. I was, I was watching it, I was like, this happened in the I, 80s? I, Bob, I, I really want to agree with you. I think that that was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's agree. great that it worked out that way, death of the author and everything, but there's also a fair amount of, like, not great oh, stuff. definitely. Yeah. yeah, there were some things at one point, like He-Man said, you're not behaving much like a lady, and then grabbed somebody and swung them around and threw them. And I was like, well, I mean, it was definitely the 80s still. Yeah. Who was your favorite He-Man character? Mm. Uh, I would die probably on a field for Bo. I know he's not He-Man, but God. Yeah, I you want to talk about him. potential gay icons. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, everything about him, Neil was like, I mean, it does look like the top he's wearing is just pointing to his dick. And I was like, I know! <laughs> That's the point! And he's, like, unabashedly wearing it. If I'm not mistaken, it. once they get over to, like, she it's like seven girls and Bo, right? Oh, Isn't yeah. that, like, the team? I refuse to believe for one second that she is not a lesbian. There's no way. I actually did read a really beautiful article that a lot of lesbian weddings have used, like, that theme song, the she or the Power of Love. Is that what it's called? It's the best theme song. I know! And they've used it, and I was like, I need to go get married again. <laughs> oh. Me Megan, Bob, now I want to commission a full, like, He-Man review series from you. Like, I want you to review <laughs> every episode in order. I just cry about it and oh. talk about how much I want to live there now. I am so hey, down hey, for this. Patrons, if you want Megan, Bob, to review every episode of He-Man on our website. It will not be about any goddamn lore. I want you to know that now. It is going to be about the feelings I have and how passionate they are. Fair enough. Oh, God. Okay. So, both you guys did a fantastic job of making your character sound like the one that... What's this? Sid. I'm not, I'm yeah, Sid. Sid. And Sid would pick Disney backwards, basically. And then the rebuttals didn't help either, because y'all kept framing and then reframing why... Your character was not just, like, better than the other, but, like, just less detestable than the other. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to, like, think about it from a lot of different angles. And, like, what would, what would this cranky old man think is the best situation for himself? And I think I'm going to have to give it to Team Orko. Whew! Yeah. yeah. I, I was like, it was not, it was not easy, though. 
Well, I know who I'm not picking in the Smash Bash. <laughs> yes. So congratulations, guys. I mean, to oh, be fair, man. that would have been the case no matter who. That, that's very true. Yeah. This was not a rich field for that. Yeah. <laughs> but Team Rinse made not- it tough. Uh, I did not you. think that this was going to be... I was like, alright, well, this will be easy. I can just take it easy on this one. I don't give a fuck. Like, this is a match of chuckleheads. Who cares? And then I was like, no, come at me! Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I started, like, a few days into the research. I was like, oh, whatever. This is a fun say what. And then I started caring a <laughs> yeah, lot. I, I wasn't trying yeah, to. Yeah, that was obvious. I don't know exactly when it happened. <laughs> yeah, uh, fantastic work, you guys. It was a pleasure, oh as God. always. Tom, Bo, the kid thinks? Is that what we're doing now? <laughs> that is what comes next. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, almost uh, interrogative, kid thinks. <laughs> yeah. like, inquisitive, almost. <gasps> Curious. We got a lot, so I'm going to try to go through them fast. Over to Twitter. Thank you to Florian, Mike Booch, Andrew Young, that one GM. That one GM who made uh, League memes for us. Yeah, a Aww. bunch of them, too. Pop on over to Twitter. You'll see those. They're pretty good, too. They're they're more derogatory than the others. Yeah, they're, they're, really, they're really trying to cut down the characters and yeah. the decisions they make. Which I think is the way to Absolutely. go. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> Tyler Fullman, Duffy, Frosty the Boltman, Cosplay Fiend, Aderpson, Jake the Fake Snake, mm-hmm. Grey Jedi Master Squid, Vander Turner, Press Down to Orb, Sabina Mosher, Chris Lynch 90, Fake Scott Kersey, Matias Tatimez, Sandwich Surplus, and Hayden Reynolds, who, by the way, made a Spotify playlist for League. Oh, and it's wonderful. It's delightful. I really like I really like that. Thank you, Hayden. That's yeah, it's real good. The so choices good. you made for the characters are very good. Like, oh, oh, keep adding to it. Over to Tumblr. Thank you to Pizamon, Changing Shades, Sid Rabbit Blog, Secretly a Skeleton, Shh, and Jeep Rhyme. And on Facebook, thank you to Yusuf Sani, Robert Ramsey, Adam Mayo, Viola Sanderlin, Daniel Kidder, and Jeffrey Ketchum. Also, thank you to David Waters, who drew Bob as Luna. Mm-hmm. Love thank you. We also wanted to thank Garrett King, who was our featured patron in this month's episode. As well as, we wanted to thank Kosuke Takahashi, yeah. who dictated this match for us uh, after he was a patron at our $10 a month level for three months. He also, if I'm not mistaken, Kit, advised you on what to do with the lightning round. Yes. And so it is you who are responsible for the new <laughs> Granny Weatherwax line of swimwear. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you to our other featured patron, David Absolutely. Bowie. <laughs> yeah. These and many other rewards await those who decide to give us patronage. And I also wanted to read out the newest iTunes review that we got <gasps> recently. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yay. This one comes to us from Gamer at Home, who gives us five stars. Their review is titled, uh, Claire, you might want to cover your ears, Doom! Oh. Why, didn't you Doom! Wa- Why didn't you warn me? I'm here too. Because it's funnier thought- when you can hear My it. ears are bleeding. <laughs> Because I stabbed them. You know, I, I, I thought I'd be used to it by now. I thought it, I thought it wouldn't bother me, but still, yeah. it's just, still just hurts. every time. You realize that Bob got me Doom shirts for Christmas, and now I'm even more into it, right? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, they're pretty amazing shirts, actually. As much as I hate the fucker. Yeah, Gamer at Home's review is nice and short and sweet. They say, very well done podcast with a lot of research backing the hilarious arguments. On board with CBC's The Debaters. Which is a thing I'm not familiar with, but anytime someone favorably compares us to literally anything else, <laughs> I become extremely flattered. So thank you very much for the kind words. So this is the third season now of Smash Fiction, and uh, we're going to be trying something a little bit different with this season. As it turns out, our lives have been getting a little more busy and a little less easy to control and schedule and do a ton of research every single week for stuff. So what we're going to be doing is every few episodes, instead of doing either a Smash Fiction match or an episode of Extraordinary League, we're going to be doing something called Smash Metafiction, which is a, uh, I don't know, it's something which is neither a match nor Extraordinary League. It's going to be us in a probably somewhat more friendly state. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Maybe we'll discuss ideas. Maybe we'll play some sort of game or do some other sort of competition. Uh, but we're going to be kind of exploring different ideas. We're not 100% sure exactly how long we're going to be doing this for or what exactly is going to come of it. So as always, as with everything we do, we very much welcome any feedback or thoughts that you guys have about uh, what it is that we do. So 
Join us next week. We are going to be doing some stuff involving spontaneous collaborative storytelling, <laughs> which I think is going to be very interesting. So join us next week for our first episode of Smash Metafiction. And the week after that, we're back to Smash Fiction with Sweeney Todd versus the Phantom of the Opera. Smash Fiction is produced by Miles Schneiderman and production assistant Sharon Holden, with logo designed by Colin Mulcairin. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod of the Clan McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Hitman. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. Miles, I'm going to get deep into this shit. Just if I go too deep, will you pull me out? I, I'll, I'll try. It depends on how much I'm enjoying myself. Is, is this like Inception where you you have like Bob's like going to be lifted up yeah. above a tub full of water her, and her you can like kick. drop her into it? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. probably... That's... Just be like, Bob! <laughs> Please do. Who is this? You got to Google it. You'll see. Okay. What's a YouTube series? <laughs> Eat dick. <laughs> Maybe I will. Fine, I just told you to. <laughs> Good for you. Can you wait till Enjoy we're off it. air at least. You've earned it. <laughs> I'm so thirsty for all the salt. Oh. That got way dirtier than I meant to be. <laughs> Did it. All right, can somebody do the He-Man theme song? Because all I have in my head right now is the theme song from Dynasty or Dallas, but I don't know which one. Dun, 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 dun.